Hello friends. So today we're going to be talking about hematuria that is blood in urine. So uh, this video is going to have multiple parts and we're going to discuss all the aspects of hematuria. It's going to include what are the causes of hematuria, what should be the relevant history that we take, what are the investigations that we do and what is the treatment for each and every disease. So stick around till this series gets over. And before we go ahead, I would like to mention that this is only an educational video. This is not a health advice. So before uh, you take any decision for your child's health, please consult a doctor or a health professional. So let's move ahead. So what does hematuria mean? Hematuria simply means blood in the urine. And it's a very scary thing for a parent and also a very confusing thing for a doctor. So according to KDGO and IPNA, these are the prominent bodies in pediatric nephrology and nephrology all over the world. Hematuria is classified as gross hematuria and microscopic hematuria. So if you see these pictures, okay, so what does gross hematuria mean? Gross hematuria means that when a child passes urine, you can see blood in it with your naked eyes. And what does microscopic hematuria mean? It means that the urine which you see is clear, but when you examine the sample of urine under a microscope, you're going to see a lot of RBCs. So how many red blood cells do we need in a sample of urine to label a patient as hematuria? So the ISN recommends that you need to have more than five RBCs per high power field to label as hematuria. So what does that mean? So it's very simple. So when a sample of urine is seen under a microscope, it looks like a grid and each square of this grid is a high power field. So when you zoom it, you see all these RBCs. So when there are more than five red blood cells in each small square, that is when you call it as hematuria. So let's go ahead. Now there's something known as dipstick positive hematuria. What that means is, when you see a specimen of urine, it looks red or dark brown. When you see under a microscope, the RBCs are less than 5 per high power field. But when you would do a dipstick, that's when it shows that RBCs are present. What does that mean? So this phenomenon actually occurs because the dipstick reacts to pigments like hemoglobin and myoglobin. This happens when there is breakdown of blood cells or there is breakdown of muscle known as rhabdomyolysis. So these pigments react with the dipstick and give a positive reaction. It's not actually blood but because these pigments react with the enzyme in the dipstick that's why we call it a dipstick positive hematuria but it's not actually blood in urine. And apart from that, urine can appear red or dark brown because of drugs, pigments or food items or coloring agents. So up till now we've discussed the types of hematuria based on appearance. Now let's discuss the types of hematuria based on the origin of the bleed. So it's divided into two types, upper and lower hematuria. So what does this mean? So basically, the urinary tract is divided into two parts known as the upper urinary tract which includes the cortex or the mass of the kidney. And the lower urinary tract is the pelvic glacial system till the urethra. So if there is any bleeding from the parenchyma or the nephron to be specific, it's known as upper hematuria. And if there is any bleeding from the pelvic glacial system to the urethra, it's known as lower hematuria. Why is this important? Because the presentation of a patient is totally different based on which location the bleeding comes from. So let's start with the appearance of the urine. So bleeding from the upper urinary tract is tea colored or cola colored. Whereas bleeding from the lower urinary tract is red colored and it can have blood clots as well.
So let's discuss the common causes of hematuria. The most common cause can be fever, exercise or any trauma. The other causes can be urinary tract infections anywhere along the urinary tract or kidney stones. What do kidney stones do? They basically damage the urothelium resulting in bleeding into the urinary tract. And then coming to the most important causes of hematuria, the glomerular bleeding. So the most common causes are PSGN that is post streptococcal glomerular nephritis, IgA nephropathy, lupus nephritis, Alport syndrome and thin basement membrane disease. There are many other causes but these are the most commonly ones seen. Let's move ahead. Now talking about the pathophysiology, there might be some questions in your mind by now. So what's the difference between glomerular and non-glomerular bleeding? Like why are we stressing so much? Why is the urine color so different in both the situations? And why are the symptoms so different? Let's see ahead. So let's talk about glomerular bleeding first because that's very important. Now if you see, this is a nephron which is the functional unit of the kidney. And if we zoom into this, this part is the glomerulus. So now let's see a better picture of the glomerulus. Let's understand the parts of the glomerulus. This part is the afferent arteriole where blood from the body comes into the glomerulus. Over here we see the glomerular capillaries and from these capillaries blood is filtered and it enters into the urinary space. Filtered blood returns to the body from the efferent arteriole. Now if we zoom in a bit, this is an individual capillary. It is lined by this blue cells known as the endothelium and here we see the RBCs. Now if we move further ahead, we see two things. Number one, these green cells. They are known as podocytes or epithelial cells and this line is known as the glomerular basement membrane. So the endothelium, the glomerular basement membrane and the porocytes. These three form the glomerular filtration barrier. What this barrier does is prevents passage of blood and proteins into the urine. Now when this barrier gets damaged due to antigen antibody reactions in glomerular nephritis, it leads to leakage of blood and proteins into the urine because of which there is hematuria and proteinuria. But then why is this blood cola colored? Very simple. This blood has to squeeze through these barriers because of which there is breakdown of blood and release of hemoglobin. And this hemoglobin gets metabolized and this leads to a cola colored or a tea colored urine. I hope that clears your doubt. Now coming to the other symptoms. So why is there edema or swelling all over the body when there is glomerular nephritis? Very simple. Now as we discussed there is leakage of proteins in the urine. So what is the function of proteins in urine? So we look at this diagram. So this is a diagram of a blood vessel. Okay, these are the walls of the blood vessel. The green dots are albumin molecules. Now what albumin does is it holds on to water inside the blood vessels. So you see these blue dots. This is water holding on to albumin because of which there is no loss of water or what we can say is leakage of water outside the blood vessels. Albumin holds on to this water. Now when the albumin concentration in blood decreases, we have water molecules free of albumin. Now if these water molecules are not binding to albumin, I'll say it's not binding actually because there's an oncotic pressure because of which uh, water does not uh, leave albumin but when the albumin content in blood decreases these water molecules are free to extravasate into the tissues outside the blood vessels because of which we have swelling all over the body i hope that clears the doubt of why there is swelling all over the body in 
glomerulonephritis. In the next two symptoms, there is a correlation. So why is there low urine output and kidney failure in glomerulonephritis? So as we discussed, there is low albumin in the blood. So all the water goes in the extravascular tissue. So there is lesser intravascular volume. So because of that, there is decreased glomerular filtration. And because of decreased GFR, there is low urine output and at the same time there is kidney failure. Then why do we have hypertension? So now what happens is all the fluid is in the extravascular space. So because of that there is decreased glomerular filtration rate. Now the body's response to decreased glomerular filtration rate is activation of the renin angiotensin system. And that leads to hypertension and along with that there is fluid overload as well. So these are the two reasons why there is hypertension in glomerulonephritis. In the next two symptoms there is a correlation. So why is there low urine output and kidney failure in glomerulonephritis? So as we discussed there is low albumin in the blood. So all the water goes in the extravascular tissue. So there is lesser intravascular volume. So because of that, there is decreased glomerular filtration. And because of decreased GFR, there is low urine output. And at the same time, there is kidney failure. Then why do we have hypertension? So now what happens is all the fluid is in the extravascular space. So because of that, there is decreased glomerular filtration rate. Now, the body's response to decreased glomerular filtration rate is activation of the renin angiotensin system. And that leads to hypertension. And along with that, there is fluid overload as well. So these are the two reasons why there is hypertension in glomerulonephritis. So now let's proceed to understand how bleeding occurs in lower hematuria. So when do we call it lower hematuria? When there is bleeding from anywhere from the pelvic glacial system to the urethra. Now, the pelvic glacial system up to the urethra is lined by urothelium. Now, this urothelium has a layer of capillaries underneath its surface. Now, if there is damage to the urothelium, these capillaries get exposed and blood is released into the urinary space. Now what is important is there is no filtration barrier here. The blood cells release directly into the urinary system. So these are fresh and intact RBCs and that's why they are rare. They are not metabolized or they are broken and that's why hematuria in lower hematuria is red in color and there can be blood clots because it's fresh bleeding. So now that we've understood how the bleeding occurs, let's understand the symptoms associated with lower hematuria. So the urothelium is also lined by nerves. So there is pain and along with pain, there can be symptoms like straining hesitancy. So what does that mean? So you're trying to pass urine, but you're unable, you're straining a lot. Then you can have urgency. What does urgency mean? Uh, it's a sensation of wanting to pass urine immediately after having one evacuation of the bladder. Then what is urge incontinence? Urge incontinence means that you have an urge to pass urine, but the urge is so strong that even before you reach the washroom, you pass urine in your pants. And the last symptom is frequency. What does frequency mean? that you have multiple urges to pass urine throughout the day and that is more than eight times. So understand one thing, lower hematuria has these lower urinary tract symptoms and upper hematuria is painless because there is no involvement of any nerves in the same. So let's go ahead. A quick word on microscopic hematuria. As we had discussed before, the urine appears clear, but we see RBCs more than 5 per high power field in the microscope. Now apart from that what is more important is that it's not just one sample you need to have at least more than two out of three properly collected samples and this should be 
over a period of one to two weeks. It can't be just one day because because of fever, exercise, exertion, you can have RBCs in the urine. So you need to have it consistently positive, and it has to be detected by dipstick and confirmed by microscopy, so that we rule out hemoglobinuria or myoglobinuria as well. And speaking of the incidence. Uh, it's seen in 0.5 to 2 percent of routine pediatric urine screening. So when there's school health camps or checkups, and urine routine is done as a screening test, 2 percent of the children can have microscopic hematuria. But most of the cases are transient and benign, and nothing to worry. But if it's persistent, which is seen in 0.1 percent of school age children, then it needs to be evaluated. And if you ask, what are the causes? So. these are the causes the benign transient ones are fever dehydration exercise viral illness or a mild trauma or it could be utis or even post infectious glomerulonephritis but what is important what i wanted to discuss was these glomerular causes in the future series which is ig nephropathy alport syndrome thin basement membrane disease lupus nephritis and cetrigenia a very important in terms of long term prognosis of the kidney don't worry we're going to discuss all of these one by one so now we've come to the end of the video so if you like this video please do give it a thumbs up and if you feel that uh, you know somebody who requires this information please do share this video with them and if you like our channel and you want more such videos please click on the subscribe button and if you are a patient and your child has hematuria and you want to discuss this case with me you are most welcome to book an appointment on my website which is www.kidneydoc.in or you can come in person and discuss your child's condition with me till then thank you stay safe